it was a dark and stormy night. And it really, it really, really was. And there was a knock on my door. I opened the door and standing there was a salesman. Looked kind of haggard and wet. And he asked if he could come in. So I said, sure. He says, can we sit down in your kitchen? I said, by all means. So we sit down in my kitchen. He looks over at my water tap. And he says, sir, is this what you drink? And I said, yes, not only do we drink it, we even give it to the dog. Seems quite happy with it. And uh, then he goes on and he says, gee, with this alarmed look on his face, do you know that there are chemicals in your water? Well, I didn't know where this was heading, but I thought it was maybe a bit too early to suggest that, boy, that you knock on the wrong door because I could sniff something delicious coming out of this. So I said, what do you mean? Do you mean the H2O molecules? No, no, he says, no. I mean the invisible molecules that are in your water. Oh, yeah? He says, oh, yeah, those toxins. I can show you. So I said, I'd be happy to see that. So he digs into his briefcase. He takes out a pair of electrodes, hooks them up to a battery, plunks them into the water, turns on the current, and within about 30 seconds, starts to go cloudy. A minute later, looks absolutely wretched. He takes out the electrodes. He holds up glass, has me look at it, and it says, this is what you were drinking. You see, the message was very clear. These toxins had been hiding in the water invisibly until he scared them out of solution with his electric current. Well, of course, by now I recognized that I was looking at some iron hydroxide or rust and had nothing to do with the water. It was coming from the iron electrode, but I still wanted to see where this was heading. So I said, and he goes back into his briefcase. He takes out this water filter. He hooks it up to my tap and he says, let's take a glass of water that's run through the filter, which we do. He says, now look, and he puts his electrodes back in there. Nothing happens. Crystal clear, sign on the bottom line, right? Message is, look, whatever those toxins were, the filter removed them. So now I thought there was a time for a little chemistry lesson. So I took a little bit of salt and I added it to the filtered glass of water and I said, now you go and put back your electrodes, which you did. And of course, the same thing happened again. He couldn't understand how the tiny amount of salt had generated all of these toxins. And then I decided to do something more dramatic. I picked up the glass and I drank it because I knew that at most I was giving myself an iron supplement. When he saw that, his face turned the color of that sediment. He couldn't believe that anyone was so foolhardy. So now I said, uh, let, me, let me explain to you what is going on here. I said, do you remember in high school, doing an experiment called electrolysis. Now, of course, he didn't really remember anything like that. I said, let me, let me just tell you. It's when you take the uh, water and you pass electric current through it in a setup such as this, and the water breaks down into oxygen and hydrogen. It's called electrolysis. And if one of these electrodes happens to be iron, then the oxygen that is produced at that electron reacts with the uh, iron and you get iron hydroxide or rust. <clears throat> the reason it doesn't happen when you filter the water is because contrary to what people think, water is not a good conductor of electricity. It has to have some minerals, some ions dissolved in it, so-called electrolytes. And the filter is actually a pretty decent filter, so it removes the ions and therefore you don't get conduction of electricity, you don't get this effect. I'm not sure that he really understood this. But then I shocked him further because I bought one of the filters, not because of this silly demo, but because I was looking for filter to take out the chlorine taste of the water, which this activated carbon filter did. So this poor confused chap walked out of my house and I was watching through the window as he goes back to his car, opens the trunk, puts back his briefcase, and then slams the trunk, leans against the car, digs into his pocket and lights up a smoke. So this guy who was so worried about the toxic chemicals in my water didn't recognize all of the horrific substances that were present in the tobacco smoke. Now, of course, to him, 
his demonstration made sense because he didn't really understand the science behind it. So he wasn't really practicing fraud, but the same chemistry can be used to do that. This contraption, a foot bath, as you can see, claims to resolve kidney disease, liver disease, arthritis. So we're not talking about the common cold here. It's about six, $700. You put your feet into it and you plug it into the wall. And within a couple of minutes, you see exactly the same thing that I just showed you before. And you get this crud. The explanation being that these are the toxins that are being removed from the body. Of course, the same thing is happening here. You get the current going through the water. One of the electrodes is made of iron. You sweat a lot when you put your feet in here. That provides the electrolytes and we get this. So this is absolute uh, uh, fraud. But people who spend six, $700 on this thing will tell you that they feel better after. It's the classic placebo effect. Of course, electrolysis is, is indeed a fascinating uh, process and it is uh, widely used. Uh, I mean, obviously water can be a source of hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, it is too expensive to use this in order to produce large amounts of, uh, of oxygen, but it is done, for example, on the International Space Station. You may have wondered how they get oxygen to breathe inside of the space station. Well, they get it through electrolysis. You have these large tanks and the water is electrolyzed. The water actually in here uh, is collected from sweat, urine uh, of the astronauts. Everything is recycled. Uh, today's coffee could have been yesterday's urine. And anyway, and some of the water is broken down through electrolysis and uh, that's how they produce uh, oxygen. Uh, same thing happens on submarines. They have large electrolysis uh, units. Now, when we talk about going to Mars, that's a different story because in order to have enough oxygen to return from Mars, and of course, if we ever go to Mars, we wanna come back too, you gotta to have a rocket that takes off from Mars and that needs oxygen as an oxidizing agent. How to do it? Well, one of the tasks of, uh, uh, of the current uh, mission, uh, the rover is going around and it is going to carry out an experiment. In fact, it is carrying out an experiment that is contained in this uh, little box. And uh, it is a device that can actually manufacture oxygen from carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is 97% of the Martian atmosphere. And this little device through a process of, of electrolysis, except it's not aqueous electrolysis. Uh, here, the, uh, the uh, electrolyte is actually a solid uh, membrane, but the basic concept is the same. And uh, by passing an electric current through it, you generate oxygen. So we'll see how, how this works. Uh, Perseverance is carrying out a great job and a lot is going to be learned uh, uh, from this. But of course, the reason that we can talk about this and explain it all is because we have a good knowledge of chemistry. Of course, understandably, uh, our subject today is, uh, doesn't get the best possible imagery. Uh, people are scared of, of chemistry. They think that chemists are these crazy creatures locked up in some laboratory just thinking about what new cancer causing food additive to unleash on the public. They think that we're a different breed altogether. Where do they get these ideas? They get them from reading books like this. Hazardous chemistry, everyday life. And this is the kind of thing that is really troubling to those of us who try to communicate science properly, because of course, chemicals are not good or bad. Chemicals are not the work of the devil as it is so often portrayed. The basic notion of course, is that yes, while there may be skeletons in our, our closet, I mean, that's true. Um, over the years, chemicals are not always properly disposed of, although today the industry has cleaned up its act. But the fact is, that while we worry about some chemicals in the environment, like you know the uh, perfluoroalkyl uh, substances, what we have to do is look at this in the proper perspective, put chemistry in the limelight and understand that chemicals are not good or bad. They are just things 
this is what makes up our whole world. And we have to examine every possible chemical that is of concern on its own merit. We need to study it. There are no good or bad chemicals. There are only safe or dangerous ways to use them. And that's a very important message to get out. Let me give you an example. A recent example, I'm sure some of you have uh, saw this because the uh, internet, of course, was, was alive with this business. When a young lady uh, ran out of uh, her hairspray and decided to use Gorilla Glue spray instead, the results were disastrous. Her hair actually was glued to her scalp and she didn't know what to do. She was unable to wash it out. Luckily, a plastic surgeon in California came to her rescue. Even more luckily, he had a background in chemistry, an undergrad degree in chemistry. So he knew what to do. Now, although the social media reported this as surgery, there was absolutely no surgery involved. There was chemistry involved. He knew that there were certain solvents that could dissolve the glue. And he experimented with these before attacking the lady's head. He went into a lab and he took some wigs, he tried the Gora glue, he experimented with various solvents, which he then used on, on the subject. They rinsed it all out and she turned out to be very happy. Thank goodness for the chemistry that this plastic surgeon knew. But the point of this illustration, of course, is that Gorilla Glue is not good or bad. It all depends on how you use it. It is not designed to stick hair onto the scalp. It is excellent when it is used in other connections as a glue. Basically, uh, it is activated by moisture in the air. The bottle contains a diisocyanate and a polyol. And when you mix these together with help from uh, atmospheric moisture, you form polyurethane. <clears throat> a very useful substance. Although in social media, it was vilified because it was connected with uh, uh, the Gorilla Glue hair episode. Polyurethane has all kinds of uses. It can be used to shellac furniture. It is used to uh, put insulation around uh, rocket fuel, uh, as we saw in the space shuttle. It can be used to make fabrics. Uh, it was used to make uh, uh, soccer balls used in the World Cup. So it has a myriad of uses. Uh, some of you may have seen a classic chemical demonstration where you take a diisocyanate and a polyol and you mix them together and you get the polyurethane forming in front of your eyes. Very neat, uh, neat demo. So is it a good chemical or a bad chemical? That, that terminology just doesn't apply. It all depends on the context of use. And this is what we try to uh, emphasize and message through our office here at McGill, which is really a, a, a unique adventure and uh, our task is to separate sense from nonsense. And as, as you can well appreciate, uh, it is a very, very tough uh, challenge to do that because it takes a lot of detective work. And this kind of thing that I like to do because uh, Sherlock Holmes indeed is one of my heroes. I, I worship one of his classic phrases, which is that it is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. And of course, in science, we look at the facts, we come up with a theory. The pseudoscience people do the opposite. They have their minds made up and then they try to come up with a theory, usually of the conspiracy variety, to try to match the facts. That's what we are against. And we fight against this. We have a website and uh, we have a YouTube channel. We produce a bi-weekly uh, podcast. Um, uh, and um, essentially we, we try to make sure that people understand the difference between science and, uh, and pseudoscience. It's the pseudoscience people, of course, who peddle snake oil, who put uh, theories before facts. So we try to convert this into proper science. And we do this without any conflict of interest because we don't accept any money from any vested source. Uh, our only allegiance is to the scientific uh, method. And we wanna make sure that when our students graduate and pass out for the last time through the Roddy Gates, 
that they are well equipped to carry out critical thinking and to separate sense from nonsense. Because if we don't do a proper job, then they are at the mercy of whoever is standing on top of the tallest soapbox screaming the loudest, and those tend to be the quacks. And they have uh, learned to dress themselves in uh, pseudoscientific lingo. You know, they, they've equipped themselves. They, they know how to spout colorful language. They sound very, very convincing. And our task is to, to get around this by demystifying science, making sure that people are up to date on what happens. We hope to foster critical thinking, separate sense from nonsense if all of that works keep people out of the clutches of charlatans. When we first started this uh, operation, uh, goes back now 21 years, 22 years, actually, I thought we needed a logo. And I suggested this one to the university. It's not that we're against eating meat, of course. Although I think in North America, we probably eat too much of it. No, what we're against is this commodity which is being piled higher and deeper and gets harder and harder, harder to dig out from underneath it. It's everywhere. You can go into your local health food store and buy some aerobic oxygen. I don't know where you go to buy anaerobic oxygen, but you go here to buy the aerobic variety. And the salesperson dressed in a white lab coat, although the week before he or she may have been mopping floors at, at uh, McDonald's, will now tell you that we're putting so many chemicals into the environment that the oxygen is being destroyed in the atmosphere and that we have to replenish our oxygen content because we can't live without oxygen by putting a few drops of this into a glass of water and drinking it on a regular basis. <clears throat> this of course is absurd. The oxygen content of the atmosphere has been constant for millennia. And uh, what they have here is a little bit of potassium chlorate that, that in theory could release a trace amount of oxygen, less than what you would get in one breath. So it's total nonsense. And of course we breathe through our lungs, not through our digestive tract in any case. This is a ridiculous item. And then they might guide you over to the next aisle after they've convinced you to buy the aerobic oxygen and tell you that you also need some antioxidants and they do not see the irony on this where on one hand they're telling you that you have to replenish with oxygen and the other hand they're telling you that oxygen forms free radicals that you have to counter with antioxidants. So the nonsense goes on and on. You can buy all kinds of stuff. You can buy dehydrated water. I mean, you can sell just about anything to a scientifically illiterate public. People don't know. People don't know what gluten is. So of course there are ridiculous things uh, out there. And this is why it is so important to make sure that people have at least a basic understanding of what science is all about. And it takes a lot of energy to dispel all these myths. It takes much more energy than to spew them out in, in the first place as, you know, as we learn on a day by day basis. We are at the mercy of a tsunami of quackery, of pseudoscience of all kinds. The coronavirus, of course, has, has, has opened the door to so much of this. Colloidal silver has been hyped as the answer to COVID-19. Total nonsense. In India, they suggest that homeopathic remedies can solve the problem. Well, apparently not. We see the tragedy that is going on in India right now. Homeopathy, incidentally, is, is uh, the most absurd of all of these so-called alternative remedies. It is based on the idea that a person who is healthy and develops symptoms when they're given a substance, that substance can cure those symptoms in a sick person when it is diluted in an extreme fashion. And I mean extreme fashion because after doing what they call a 12C dilution, which means 12 times taking one drop, adding 100 drops of water, then taking one drop of that, etc. After 12C, there isn't a single drop of the original material. All you are getting is just water. And then they use this water to impregnate a little sugar pill, and that's what they sell as a homeopathic remedy. It's absolute nonsense. And if you want to further see 
how much nonsense there is. What do you think of homeopathic x-rays, diluted x-rays, whatever that means? It relieves itching or skin rash aggravated at night and in bed. And yet this stuff uh, is sold, sold in, in Canada, sold in, in, in the U.S., without any evidence whatsoever. And of course, there cannot be any evidence because there is no vestige of any active ingredient uh, in here. Of course, what you are getting is a placebo effect. If you believe that something is going to do you good, 30 to 40 of the time it will. But that doesn't mean that it is doing anything to the underlying disease. It may uh, make you deal with the symptoms in an easier fashion but the underlying disease progresses uh, as it would. So scientific illiteracy is, is a big problem and it's pervasive, it, it, it's everywhere. Uh, this brochure was delivered to me in my mailbox. It was an ad and it's an ad for underwear. Now it turns out that the underwear is pretty good. It's made of polypropylene. And the message is that it allows moisture to pass through. Okay, but let's take a look at the accompanying uh, diagram here. Notice what's happening. As the water passes through, it is being broken down. H2O, also known as sweat, is attracted to thermos skins like ants to a picnic. Our constant comfort process separates the H2 from the O, making evaporation faster. This is miraculous underwear indeed. It is carrying out electrolysis. Never mind the graphic artist who thinks that there is a covalent bond between the hydrogens and in, in, in water. But you see what's happening here. The water is being broken down into oxygen and hydrogen. Wouldn't it be great if this really happened? We'd have a solution to the energy crisis because hydrogen is a great fuel. And if all we had to do would be to wear the right kind of underwear, to produce hydrogen, we'd have pretty good idea of uh, how to treat the energy crisis. Of course, this is just a change of state. Water is just going from liquid to gas. It has nothing to do with breaking it down or electrolysis. But there it is in a brochure that was widely uh, circulated. So I've been dealing with this kind of stuff for a very long time. I, I uh, have the longest running radio show on chemistry and that I started uh, in 1980. So it's been on now for 41 years. And uh, it's the longest running radio show on chemistry in the history of the world. Uh, of course, it's also the only radio show on chemistry in history. But anyway, I, I've learned uh, what the public is sensitive to from the questions that I'm asked. And when I first started this way back in 1980, as is painfully evident, of course, only because you see the dial telephone in the picture, I don't remember the very first question I was asked, but I certainly remember the second question because it was a staggering one. I thought I heard the caller ask this rather remarkable query. Uh, I didn't know what this was all about. And you start to have these mental pictures, you know, of juxtapositions. And, and, but luckily, the caller recognized that he had spoken very quickly and he had left out a key word. And that was golf. Because as I was to learn, golfers sometimes have the habit of picking up the ball and kissing it before putting it back down and whacking it. Uh, this is, of course, for superstitious reasons. It's not a good idea to aerodynamically fill in the, the uh, uh, dimples on a on golf ball with, 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 with saliva. But the reason that he asked this question, because he knew that golf courses use pesticides, and he was worried that when he picked up his golf ball and he kissed it, he would be transferring some of the, these chemicals to his lips. So we discussed this. And I sang to him the anthem of toxicology, which is that only the dose makes the poison. And I said, look, uh, it's unlikely that you're <clears throat> transferring a significant amount of pesticide to your body like this. But I said, look, there's better life, better things in life to go around kissing than golf balls. Give it a shot. I'm not sure if he took that, uh, that advice or not. Uh, but uh, this is the, the, the impression that people have of chemicals, that they're dangerous, that they're uh, that they're uh, toxic. I, I keep getting those kind of questions more recently is tripolyphosphate a chemical? 
see, when I get that question, I know what the caller is actually asking. What they're really asking is it dangerous because to them, chemical is synonymous with poison or with toxin. And they think that, you know, uh, chemicals are just substances that are concocted by these evil chemists in a laboratory. Well, in this particular case, my caller uh, had been reading the list of ingredients on a cleaning agent, uh, Hertel Plus, pretty good cleaning agent, actually. And she saw sodium tripolyphosphate and wondered what this was. Was it a chemical? So, of course, I go on to my usual spiel that chemicals are just things. They're not good or bad. And uh, in this case, uh, it ties up minerals in the water that would interfere with the action of the detergent. And I think she was okay with that because if you expect to find chemicals somewhere, it's in cleaning agents. That's okay. That's where they belong. Two weeks later, she calls me again. I recognized her voice, even though it sounded panicky. Because once more, she had come across sodium tripolyphosphate, but this time it was on a different label. This time it was on a food label. And I, su I suspect some of you may recognize this food uh, because it's very, very popular, cheap and widely consumed. What we're looking at here is craft dinner. So the lady says to me, says, you know, I give my son craft dinner every day, which apparently was not a problem. What is a cleaning agent doing in there? So I said, look, this is a multi-talented chemical. In this case, it's not acting as a cleaning agent. It enhances water absorption by the starch in the macaroni so that when your son starts clamoring for his daily dose of craft dinner, you can deliver the goods more quickly. I'm not sure that she was satisfied this time because you expect chemicals and cleaning agents, but not in food. And I suspect she might have thought that, gee, you know, craft company knew that eating their product is a messy business. And maybe to increase sales, they found a way to, to clean the kit from the inside out. Where do they get such ideas? From reading books like this, Consumer's Dictionary of Food Additives by Ruth Winter. Who is she? I don't really know, but she doesn't have a business writing such a book which may sound like a potentially libelous statement. How do I dare make it? First of all, let's face it. The chance that she is viewing this presentation right now is pretty remote. But the other reason, a better one, is that I can back it up scientifically. If my phosphate-fearing friend had looked up in this book, phosphate, shampoos, cuticle softener, bubble bath, all of that makes sense for a cleaning agent, but reading further, also in incendiary bombs and in tracer bullets. So now she would not only worry about her kid being cleaned from the inside out, she would worry about him bursting into flame and disappearing, but not without a trace. So why do I say she has no business writing such a book? Because she obviously has made the most fundamental of all chemical errors. She doesn't understand the difference between phosphorus, which is used indeed in incendiary bombs and tracer bullets, and phosphate. Once you join oxygen to phosphorus, it has a completely different property. Phosphate is not phosphorus. So you can see how this kind of, of nonsense gets, uh, gets spread around. Uh, people are confused when they see and hear all this kind of stuff. And I understand that because it seems to be that one day something is good, the next day it's not good. One day we're told butter is killing us so that we should be eating margarine. Then we go for the margarine, we find out it contains trans fats, it's better to eat butter in the first place. It goes on and on. We're told eat as many fish as you can. Fish are full of omega-3 fats, great for reducing cardiac arrhythmia. You give it to pregnant women, they give birth to babies with higher IQs. And then you find out that the fish are contaminated with mercury or PCB. So, whoa, we can't have that. On and on it goes. We're told to drink eight glasses of water every day. Incidentally, there's no evidence for that. Anyway, so we go to the tap, we drink the purified water, and we find out that it was purified with chlorine, and that produces trihalomethanes, which are carcinogens. 
so we can't have chlorinated water. So we resort to the water cooler that has spring water loaded from these large carboys. And then we find out that the plastic here is polycarbonate and it is leaching bisphenol A into, into the water. Say, well, we can't have that. Let's get rid, rid of these containers. So we're not gonna drink anything from polycarbonate. What about from polyester? These bottles, the single serving bottles that are so popular, made of a totally different plastic. This is polyester. But when you make polyester, use a catalyst, antimony trichloride. And you probably remember antimony is in the same chemical family as arsenic, which means that they have similar chemical properties. So you say, whoa, I don't want antimony in my water. And on and on it goes, on and on. People are concerned about everything because they don't look at numbers. So once again, we come to a point that I think merits underlying many times and emphasizing that science is based on numbers. We're always evaluating, we're always measuring, we're comparing in terms of numbers. Let's go back to using numbers on the uh, bottled water example that I just uh, mentioned. These polyester bottles indeed are made using a catalyst and some of that antimony gets into the water. The first thing we want to know is how much is there. The next thing we want to know, how does it compare to an amount that could potentially be a problem? Well, today, of course, we can measure these things. The amount that is found in the water is at most three parts per billion. That doesn't tell us anything. That's a very small amount but small amounts can still be problematic. What we want to know is what the acceptable daily intake of antimony is. That is, if every drop of water that ever goes into our body is contaminated with antimony for our whole life, how much antimony can there be in there without doing any harm? So the acceptable daily intake is about six parts per billion meaning that if all water that we ever consume in every way is contaminated to that extent, we would still not have any problem. That's what that ADI means. Obviously, what we have in the water here is less than that. It is absolutely a non-issue. But of course, if you don't go into these kind of arguments, you can scare people very easily because they don't understand that only the dose makes the poison, as Paracelsus told us 500 years ago. And that, of course, is the cornerstone of toxicology. We have to abide by, by, by that uh, dictum. Now, that being said, of course, it is true that sometimes that dose may be very, very small. But nevertheless, the dose matters. I'll give you another example. I mean, most of us, I think, would agree that eating an apple is a healthy thing to do. But if I leave out numbers, look how easy it is to convince people that they should stay away from apples. When you bite into that apple, what you're tasting is this. This is just a partial list of the chemical composition of the apple. These are not additives, they're not pesticide residues. These are the building blocks of the apple. That's what it's made of, including acetone. Now, most of you, of course, are familiar with acetone in many ways as a solvent in the lab, or, as the solvent that is used to remove nail polish. And on that bottle, of course, it says, do not drink, toxic. Good advice, because acetone can kill you. Also in that apple is formaldehyde. That's the stuff that is used by embalmers to preserve bodies. This is the chemical that morticians use. Formaldehyde is very toxic and it's a carcinogen, it can kill you. So I could say, look, you're eating an apple, you're consuming acetone. That's toxic, it can kill you. But it's an economical way to go because you will be pre-embalmed. Now, of course, that would rub some people the wrong way, but there's some rubbing alcohol in that apple as well. Obviously, all of these chemicals are there just like I told you, but we don't worry about them because they are there in vanishingly small amounts. So no, that apple is not trying to take a bite out of us. 
quite the opposite. We should encourage the eating of apples because the nutrients, the vitamins, the minerals, the phytochemicals greatly outweigh any of the detrimental effects of the acetone or the formaldehyde. Numbers matter. Toxicology is based upon the evaluation of numbers. We of course live in a chemical world. Everything in the world is made of chemicals. They are the basic building blocks of all matter. And there are a lot of them. Chemical abstracts now lists over 134 million chemicals. More than 99% of these, of course, are naturally occurring. But those are not the ones that get attention in publications and on social media. It's the synthetic ones because of this illusion that if something is synthetic, it is suspect. If something is natural, it is bound to be beneficial and healthy. This of course is nonsense. Nature is not benign. The most dangerous substances that we know are natural, botulin toxin, ricin from castor beans, bacteria, viruses, insect venoms. These are all perfectly natural. We spend our life trying to overcome the ravages of, of, of nature. Look at the complexity of the world in which we live. Your lunch will contain hundreds of different compounds. Our body is really a compendium of thousands of compounds in our breath, our saliva, our, our blood, etc. Et we are veritable chemical depositories. When you drink a cup of coffee, you are ingesting over a thousand different compounds, some of which are known carcinogens. Benzene, acrylamide, formaldehyde, turfrol, these are known carcinogens. Yet, of course, we know that coffee is not carcinogenic. If it were, this we would know. There are enough people around the world drinking enough coffee that this would have cropped up already. So how is it that we have carcinogens in there, but the whole concoction is not carcinogenic? Because obviously each of these is present in such small amounts that it's irrelevant. Furthermore, coffee contains a whole bunch of uh, antioxidants, which can mitigate the effects of these uh, possibly nasty uh, chemicals. So we live in a very complex world chemically, and it is uh, treacherous to try to attribute any kind of, of uh, specific bad effect or toxic effect to an individual uh, chemical. Our urine contains more than 3,000 compounds, some of which we are ingested and ingest and just go straight through. Some of them are metabolites of the food that, that we eat. Uh, so again, we are a very, very complex chemical entity. Certainly the urine can be a measure of what we are exposed to because if something goes into the body, it's going to come out one way or another, maybe metabolized, broken down, but the remnants will then come out. So we can indeed monitor what's going on. So for example, if we are interested in our exposure to bisphenol A, and these days we are interested in that, this is a, a chemical that is notorious because it has endocrine disrupting properties. It's used to make the lining of food cans. Uh, it's of course used to make polycarbonate uh, plastics. And we don't want excessive exposure to this for sure. Well, one way to monitor exposure is to look at the urine, but you have to remember that what shows up in the urine is what comes out of the body. What we're really interested in, in terms of toxicology is what stays behind in the fatty tissues and what stays behind in the blood. And the amount of bisphenol A that stays behind is very, very little. It is virtually all uh, excreted. So it's hard to imagine how it can do all of the deadly things that have been ascribed to it when it doesn't stay behind uh, in the body. But anyway, the urine is one way that we can monitor our, our exposure. And this is done by using uh, equipment at our disposal these days. And these are the gas chromatographs and mass spectrometers. And we can detect chemicals in urine or in blood these days uh, in um, infinitely small amounts. We can detect quite routinely these days parts per trillion 
That is an unbelievable small amount. That is one grain of sand in an Olympic sized swimming pool. Or if you want an even more visual analogy, it is the width of a credit card in the distance between the earth and the moon. We can detect that. That's not finding a needle in a hay straw. That's finding a needle in a world full of hay straws, of haystacks. And just because we find one needle in a haystack somewhere does not mean that we're gonna give up a good old fashioned roll in a hay just because there might be one needle in one haystack somewhere because the benefits outweigh the risks. And that's what it always comes down to. It comes down to measurements, comes down to some critical thinking and proper evaluation. Life is full of risks. No matter what we do, you can be out for a casual walk and terrible things can happen. Oh, I know you're probably going, ooh and ah, don't. Uh, the fact is that we're good people, we faked it and uh, they're fine. But they're not the innocent creatures that you may think that they are. There are hazards everywhere. It's always a question of weighing risk against benefit. People are willing to take risk when they know what the risk is, such as in this case. But they get upset when they feel that a risk is imposed on them. That is when they find out that there's some bisphenol A in their food because they didn't put it there. So evaluating risk against benefit is not an easy thing to do but this is what we have to strive for. But we also have to understand that if we find a risk somewhere and if there's a chemical that needs to be replaced, we have to make sure that the replacement has been found to be safer so that we don't wanna be going from the frying pan into the fire. Now, obviously there are some risks that we can avoid, right? You can avoid trespassing here, and then you avoid the risk. But not all risks are avoidable. However, you cannot equate the presence of a chemical to the presence of risk. Just because we find something doesn't mean it's doing something. That takes a lot more investigation. But unfortunately, these days in the public mind, if a chemical is there, it is just judged to be guilty without looking any further. Now, I want to leave you here with a few ideas that I think you do want to pass on whenever you have uh, discussions with people who have uh, questions about the way that science works. First of all, the effects of a chemical do not depend on its ancestry. It doesn't matter if a chemical was made by mother nature in a plant or by a chemist in a lab. What matters is what it is, how we have studied it, and how much we know about it, never mind its, uh, its ancestry. Also, you have to understand that humans are not giant rodents. And many of our experiments on, in toxicology are based on mice and rats. They don't necessarily apply to humans, but of course, ethically, we cannot do experiments on humans. So we have to extrapolate from these rather uh, primitive creatures and make educated guesses. Also, very important to emphasize that children are not small adults and that a substance that may be toxic in an infant or an embryo may be totally harmless in an adult. One of the first things we teach students in med school is this, that when you're dealing with children, you're dealing with a totally different species because when the nervous system is just forming, is much easier to put a wrench into the works than when it is already formed. Also, important to understand that even with animals, different ones, even though they may be closely related, can have very, very different reactions. For example, dioxin, widely talked about as the most toxic substance ever made, never made on purpose. It's always a side product of a, of a chemical reaction, undesired. It is extremely toxic when you're talking about a guinea pig, but if you're a hamster, you can practically frolic in it. 
Or another example is chocolate. Imagine it didn't exist, as horrific a thought as that is. And someone just came up with chocolate and wanted to test it on animals and chose the dog as the animal to test it, we wouldn't have any chocolate because dogs cannot handle the theobromine in chocolate. It's toxic to them, but perfectly okay for us. So different species handle chemicals differently. We don't have to worry about eating chocolate because we handle the theobromine very, very well. No matter what, you cannot avoid risk. You cannot prove that there's no risk associated with a chemical. Um, give you an analogy. I couldn't even prove to you that reindeer cannot fly. I could take a reindeer, take it up to the top of a tall building, nudge it off, and let's face it, if that animal ever were motivated to fly, that's the moment. We'd have a mess at the bottom. We could repeat it with the same result. All we would have proven is that those reindeer today, for some reason, could not or chose not to fly. Maybe there are some reindeer, maybe eight of them, which given the right stimulation, given the right date, maybe they can fly. So you can never prove that something cannot happen. You cannot prove a negative. Also, there are always opposing views in science. This is common, even among experts. Look at climate change. There will be opposing views. However, what we have to look for is consensus, majority view. 97% of climate scientists agree that there's climate change and that humans are at least partially responsible. But the 3% who hold the alternative opinion very often may be far more vocal and may be better speakers as far as the public is concerned. So there will always be a divergence of opinions. We have to look to see where the majority opinion lies. And you can prove almost anything you want to prove from the scientific literature these days because there's so much stuff being published. You can prove that tomatoes cause cancer or prevent cancer. Same thing for potatoes and onions, etc. Looking at this chart, the only one that has no positive feature is bacon. But guess what is the fastest growing food in North America today? Yep, it's bacon. You can prove almost anything you want to prove by cherry picking data. But in real science, that's not what we do. We shake the whole tree and then pick all of the cherries and mash them together and then taste it. That's how we come to a conclusion. That's the scientific method. But it can go astray because people are often wedded to anecdotes. But the plural of anecdote is not data. If your neighbor says that their cold was cured by taking a homeopathic remedy, that is not proof. And no matter what, we can never predict all consequences of our actions. Who could have ever predicted in the 1930s when we switched out sulfur dioxide and ammonia in refrigerators for the much safer Freon? Who could have predicted that 50 years in the future, Freon would end up in the atmosphere destroying the ozone layer? There's no way anyone could have predicted that. But one of the biggest problems that we face in science communication is the correlation not the same as causation issue. Because it is so easy for people to be seduced by correlation. And we have to make sure that they understand that this is not the same thing. For example, the hot weather is soon going to be with us. People will be eating a lot of ice cream. They'll be eating a lot of sunburn. They will be getting sunburn. If we plot the incidence of sunburn against sales of ice cream, you get a strong correlation. It doesn't mean that they two are related. The reason I point this out, because these days you often see graphs like this, where they show you the increase in sales of glyphosate, the most widely used herbicide in the world, and the rise in autism, leading you to the conclusion that glyphosate causes autism. This is an association that does not cause an effect. I could also draw a curve showing an association between autism and sales of organic food. And of course, organic food is unlikely to cause autism, but looks like a very impressive association. So these are important features to point out. And these days, of course, we are trying to not only point these things out, but we're also trying to do the right things. 
we are trying to practice green chemistry using the safest possible substances and the safest methods, using the least amount of reagents, et cetera, because we have a lot of accumulated knowledge about how the world works and what toxicity is all about. This is not uh, to say that we don't have problems. Of course we do, but the problems are not as big as people may believe. There is no cancer epidemic out there Cancer rates are, are in fact constant and life expectancy is getting longer and longer. This is not a plea to become cheerleaders for chemistry. That's not the point. Chemicals are not good or bad. They are just things. But it is a plea for good science and for promoting critical thinking and for making sure that people understand what the scientific method is all about that chemicals are not to be feared, neither are they to be worshiped. They are to be understood, but they aren't always. Look at this chemistry set. In fact, it's rare to find any chemistry set these days, but here's one. Look what it says on it. It's a chemistry set, no chemicals required. This is how chemophobia has torpedoed chemistry by suggesting that you can do chemical experiments without requiring chemicals. Well, of course we do have to think about chemicals. Obviously, I hope I've, I've been able to, to get that message across. It's not a question of good or evil. It's a question of, of understanding. And uh, sometimes, you know, this point is brought home. It was brought home to me in a very interesting way with uh, the last book that, uh, that I published and uh, I get a, a call from my uh, publisher and he says, you know, you should be happy because your book made it onto the bestseller list. I thought, you know, that, that's great. And I look on the bestseller list and my book is a, a grain of salt. And indeed there it was just a week after it was released. I said, gee, you know, that's pretty good. I was happy until I start glancing up the list to see what else is there. And I see at number five, Anthony William, the so-called medical medium who gets advice from spirits. And then he translates that to people. He practices medicine without a license on the radio. He gets away with it because he says the advice is coming from a spirit world. And the spirit almost always says, that the therapy is drinking celery juice. So I was a lot less excited when I saw uh, what else there was on that bestseller list. Anyway, as you can see, there certainly is a lot of need out there to separate sense from nonsense because there's a copious amount of nonsense out there. And this is what we try to do. And I hope that you guys will also make, make, uh, make an effort. Uh, you may get some help from our website because there, we have thousands of articles there uh, that uh, I think are, are useful. Uh, so I welcome you to uh, come see there. We also have a newsletter that you can sign up for for free that comes uh, out once a week. So I hope I've been able to give you a little bit of insight into the importance of, of uh, science communication and uh, the approach that we take as you can see, uh, visuals, I think, are very important. Uh, pictures worth a thousand words. Uh, that holds true. And, uh, you know, if you can throw in a little bit of, uh, of humor, that always works as well. Mm -hmm.